Amen. I think I just kept on praying for a couple hours there. You just get on that roll and just get in the spirit and you just start saying the things that the Lord puts on our hearts. So awesome. So awesome to do what he says, right? He did say, my sheep hear my voice. Does God speak to those that hear him, to those that follow him, to those that act like sheep and are sheep, not to those wolves in sheep's clothing, right? But anyway, the Holy Spirit put them on my heart for this evening. And I'll just, as, as, as events unfold worldwide, we can definitely see and know that, that things are just all falling into place as the Bible said they would. How many people are saying that things are happening and falling into place? Just like Messiah Yeshua said. He did say these things would happen before his return. He said this in chapters like Matthew chapter 24, Mark chapter 13, Luke chapter 21. I mean, he was specific. He gave us specific things that would happen, and we should be aware. He said if if you knew when the person was going to break into your house, when the thief would come and break in, you would watch, right? He encourages us to watch. He doesn't encourage us to be afraid. We're not to be afraid. We don't have a spirit of fear. We have not been given a spirit of fear. We've been given a spirit of power and love and a sound mind. When he is with us, the Bible says, nothing and no one can be against us. He is El Shaddai. He is almighty. And uh, he protects us as he protected his people from the beginning of time, as he said to Abraham, as I, as I mentioned earlier, that he was his shield, and he protected him, and he blessed him. Can God protect us and bless us in times of trouble? Yes, he's proven that over and over through time. And uh, I remember, I remember praying that because you know, there's a lot of people there. There's a lot of, a lot of fear mongering out there, especially in the you know in the believing community, and um, especially with we're supposed to be the people in the know. And some of the things that are going to happen before his return are, are pretty scary. It says in Luke chapter 21, for example, that men's hearts would fail them for looking on upon things that are coming on the earth. Pretty scary stuff. But our God is is protecting us. And I, I remember a long time ago asking the Lord, I said, I said, if 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 the stuff's really going to hit the fan in the world and things are really going to get ugly and you know stuff's going to just happen. How are you going to protect us, you know, that we're going to be in the midst of this stuff? And, you know, because some people believe that we're all going to be raptured out of here before anything happens. How many of those stuff is happening and we're still here? We could be here for a little while longer. Uh, we might be here for the duration before his return. You know, some people say, well, we might be here through the tribulation period. I mean, I don't think he would have warned his disciples about the tribulation if we weren't going to be part of it or here. But just because there's tribulation going on doesn't mean it has to affect us. True. And I remember asking the Lord, how are you going to protect us? And he said, and then he reminded me of, of how what he did for Israel when they were in Egypt and they were remember in the land of Goshen. And he began to and he began to rain down judgment upon the Egyptians. And ugly and horrible things were happening to the Egyptians. We're not to rejoice over those kinds of things. And yet the people, his people were under his divine protection. None of the things that happened to the Egyptians as he was as he was dealing with them have touched the nation of Israel. And so and even when even when the Egyptians came after the Israelites, and these were a slave pe these were people that were in slavery. They were not a strong people. They didn't especially eat well, you know, it was like probably a bunch of skinny folk. And anyway, the Lord protected him from the strongest army and, and showed his power. I mean, there's nothing that can come against uh, him and win. I mean, there's nothing. And so that's why it says when, when he is with us, nothing can be against us. And so we're to make sure that in the last days we're in him and we're with him and we stay close to him. And, um, and the Bible specifically says that it is our faith that overcomes this world. It is our relationship with him. It is our intimacy with him that keeps us within that divine protection. I remember many times when I first became a believer, people I would hear people pray, and I would pray this for myself, a uh, hedge of protection. You've heard that? Oh, I pray a hedge of protection. How many know that he is the hedge of protection? 
And when we stay within him, we are within the hedge of protection. And if we wander out, we're vulnerable. Is that simple? Like he said, he said to Jerusalem or to the people in Jerusalem, he said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, I would have gathered you as a hen gathers her chicks, but you wouldn't. In other words, you would not come under his divine protection. They, they rejected him. And because they rejected him, they, he basically said to them, your house, behold, he said, your house is left unto you desolate. You don't want my divine protection? You're on your own. And then he prophesied what happens to people that are on their own without his divine protection. And this is why, you know, this is why the Jewish people have suffered so much over the years, because of not getting into his divine protection. And I was one of those people, and I've seen the difference between between not having a relationship with God and turning my back on Him, what my life was and what my life is now with this intimacy and protection that I received from the Lord. It's like night and day. You have Him or you don't. It is or it isn't. He's real or He's not. He's telling us the truth or, or He isn't. And, um, and He gave us warnings and things that were going to take place in the last days if you would turn with me to Matthew 24 as we as we um, continue here tonight. I mean, you, know, you can't go wrong when you listen to him. I have discovered this in my walk with the Lord. Sometimes I, I started to, to, to start to listen to people and more than I listened to him. And, and it got me in a bit of trouble. You never go, you never go wrong listening to him because he's never wrong. I mean, we're subject to error. Even some of the greatest leaders and spiritual leaders, we're subject to error. He's not subject to error. He made no errors. The Bible says he was sinless. Sinless means he made no mistakes. And so everything he said is pure. Everything he said is true. Everything he said is going to come to pass because he said it and because it will come to pass. Because no one will ever stand before him and say, you lied. Because that's one thing God cannot do is lie. I don't think any of us qualify for that. But he doesn't lie. God cannot lie. So if the Lord says something, you can bank on it. And so look with me in Matthew 24, beginning in verse 3. Matthew 24 and verse 3, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives... The disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world? Now, some people said these things have already taken place, but how can these be the sign of his coming and of the end of the world if they already took place 2,000 years ago? I don't think that makes sense. Do you? I don't think so. But anyway, one of the signs, the first sign which we should absolutely know and, and be aware of is what he said here in verse 4, when Yeshua answered and said to them, take heed of this new world order. He didn't say that. Yet many Christians today are just harping on this new world order. I'm not saying that there's not going to be a new world order, but I'm saying that's not the first sign that he gave of his return. The first sign that he gave of his return is take heed that no man deceive you why? Because he answers it in verse 5. For many shall come in my name. He didn't say a few. He said many would come, right? And would say, I am Christ. Now, if somebody comes in and says they're Christ or they're the Messiah, we're like, ha, 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 he, 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 ho, ho, ho. Right? Most of us would. Some people, you know, there's false messiahs, and people actually follow them. We've seen a few false messiahs or have heard of, of, of false messiahs over the over the centuries and over the years, and many people have followed them. But I mean, if you're born again, you have the Holy Spirit, we should be a little more astute than that, right? But anyway, he said that many would come in his name, so the deception is coming by many, and they would come in his name. In other words, people saying, I am, I'm with him, or he's with me, right? Same thing. Or or, or the another word for it, and the, and the Holy Spirit put this on my heart a long time ago, the word Christ means anointed. A lot of people today use that word very loosely. I am anointed. She's anointed. He's anointed. Things like that. Not to say that every person that says they're anointed means they're a false teacher. 
But when I hear I'm anointed, I, I immediately red flags go up because, you know, only a couple of times did he actually say he was the Messiah. He kept it low key. I don't know if you noticed that. He didn't make a big advertisement about it. People that constantly advertise that they're anointed, you need to watch out for that. Because if you really are anointed and you really are walking in the anointing and you're walking in the footsteps of the Messiah, the things that manifest out of your walk will speak volumes about your anointing. You won't have to tell people you're anointed. They will see that you're anointed. They will experience the anointing. They will see and they will experience. And so, and so we need to be careful because it says, and shall deceive. Yeshua said, not only would many come in his name, he said, but many would be deceived. If you notice at the end, the last sentence in verse 5, it says, and shall deceive many. And so the, the, the deception has to be pretty good. It has to be very good deception. And notice what it says here, verse 11, and many false prophets shall rise. And again, he said, shall deceive many. So it's something that we should be aware of. True. If many would be deceived, if many are going to fall into this trap, we should know how not to be deceived in the last days by false teachers and false prophets and false anointings because they're coming in his name. Now, some are pretty obvious, but some are not so obvious. And, uh, for example, it says, um, verse 24, For there shall arise false Christ, false messiahs, and false prophets, and Yeshua said, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. That means that the signs and the wonders that are coming are going to be are going to be so good that many would be deceived. And I don't want to get into the deceptions, because when we get into error. We'll be here the rest of our lives preaching about error. We need to preach what and teach what is right. If we, if we are familiar with what is right, when we are exposed to what is wrong, then we will recognize it. I, I believe this is how bank tellers are trained in to, to, to spot fake money. They don't handle fake money all day, so when it hits their hand, they would know that it's fake money. They handle real money day in and day out. And so these people are handling real money all the time. When a fake bill hits their hand, they're like, that's a fake bill. Why? Because they're so used to what is right. We need to know and become familiar with what is right. So when the fake stuff is exposed to us or we're exposed to the fake stuff, we will recognize it. And, and so we need a little information. We need a little information from the true anointed one, wouldn't you say? He was truly the anointed one. He is the Messiah. There's no question about it. How many people say he was the Messiah? That's why the Bible says, make your election sure. Because how many know there's going to be a battle? That Are you sure or are you not sure? Turn with me to Matthew 11. Matthew 11 beginning in verse 1. And it came to pass when Yeshua had made an end of commanding his twelve disciples, he departed thence to teach and to preach in their cities. Now, verse 2 says, when John, talking about John the Baptist, right? John had heard in the prison, it says, now when John had heard in the prison the works of Messiah, when he heard about the works of Messiah, he sent two of his disciples and said to him in verse 3, Are you he that should come, or do we look for another? Are you the one? Are you the Messiah? Are, the, are you the anointed one? Are you it? Why would they say that? Because there's been a bunch of false it's. There were false it's before him. That's why he said, All that ever came before me were thieves and robbers, because he's the real McCoy. Or the real McCohen. I heard somebody say that once, and I thought it was funny, so I just kept it in the back of my mind, and lo, I just used it. 